further ado, it's my great pleasure to once again welcome Richard Gerber. We had the pleasure in welcoming Richard back in lockdown as part of a special event here in Spain, and it really is wonderful to be able to hear from him again. So Richard, it's over to you. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, hello, everybody. I was just saying before we came on air, although there are many issues with not being able to meet each other live and to work together in that forum, there's something very powerful about these virtual events that bring people together from across the world. And if nothing else, it'll be really interesting for you to communicate with each other on the uh, chat, I think, as we go through not just this session, but the incredible set of sessions that Cambridge have put on both yesterday and today. But I want to start by saying how honored I am to be here. So we're going to talk a little bit about this, feeling ready for change. And I don't think we can start any session in the current climate without really referring to the lived experience that we've all been through to one degree or another over the last few months. Um, and I want to, to start at a very personal level because I think it's very pertinent to all of us who work in education. Because really what we've lived through in the last six or seven months has been a hyper amplified degree of change. And in many ways, as we've been talking about for many, many years now, uh, change we know isn't new, but what we do know is that the world is changing faster and more unpredictably than it ever has, and it will continue to do so long after, hopefully, this COVID crisis is brought under control. But the nature of change on a human level means that we react in a very set uh, series of ways. And particularly when you think that most of us, because of our education and upbringing, have been prepared to live in worlds of certainty. You know, our education system in so many ways is predicated on that idea that we seek out certainty. We are educated to learn what we're told to learn in the way we're told to learn it. We're assessed in, in set ways and then we're rewarded when we go through that path of certainty. And, and also, of course, the education system is predicated to funnel us into specific routes. And our reward as we hit that route, get our heads down and work hard towards it right into adult life is a life of certainty. So when moments of change and transformation hit, they have a profound impact on us as people. Now, I don't know about you, but when the gravity of the COVID crisis first hit me, I went into a kind of state of mental paralysis. Nothing was going in. I couldn't take in the information. It felt it was, a, it was like being bombarded and I just couldn't take it in. I couldn't process it. And what that led to after a while was a kind of denial. Again, you know, I don't know how many of you this might be familiar to, but I started to believe, oh, this isn't as bad as they're telling us. This, this won't reach me. This will be over soon. We'll be back to normal. And when that didn't help in any way to make me feel better, I guess I became angry. You know, I became angry at everybody, everybody I could be angry with, from politicians and policymakers through to where the virus first came from, right down to my neighbors who I was watching as they broke lockdown by having too many people round to their house. And of course, that didn't help either. And it certainly didn't make me feel that I had a level of control back. And that led to the fourth phase, which was a kind of mild depression. You know, that listlessness that often comes from an absence of hope, I suppose. That belief that actually everything now is beyond my control. I'm simply a victim. And, you know, for me, that was things like not getting out of bed in the morning, obviously not shaving. Um, you know, that, that idea that everything just ground to, to a halt. And for many people in education and in life, we're feeling that more and more and more, but obviously never more acutely than we have in the last few months. And of course, the real trick to gaining back a sense of control 
is to stop being passive and to force yourself to become active in whatever that change process is. And that begins really with asking questions, exploration, experimentation, starting to try and get a handle on things, to be curious, to start to piece together the world as you understand it and to ask questions of yourself, which are about, okay, so what can I do to make things better for me and the people around me? And if we get into that process of questioning, then we can lead into the sixth and most powerful phase, which is one of acceptance or, or activation where actually we feel a semblance of control coming back to us. And that means we're more likely to engage with enthusiasm. Now, in a way, when you think about it, the processes, the six steps that I've just gone through will be familiar to us, not just in terms of what we've lived through in our recent experience or even in other forced moments of change, but as educators, you know, how often do we have things implemented or things top down driven to us where those same emotions come through? And also to an extent, there's a degree of that truth in our children. Now, the danger is that in order to try and scrabble around and find control, we make things overcomplicated. <laughs> this is the world's first Starbucks. And I was there uh, a few years ago. Um, I decided to queue up and do the tourist thing and get a coffee from the world's first Starbucks. And I gotta say, I was really quite excited, more than anything, because I thought I could take a selfie and send it to my daughter and she'd be suddenly miraculously proud of me for being so cool and groovy that I'd visited the world's first Starbucks. And it turns out that every other father in Seattle was doing the same thing on the same day because the queue went back for well over a kilometer and a half, maybe two kilometers. But I stuck it out because I'm a good dad. Anyway, I got to the front of the line and here's the problem. I'm a really simple guy and that goes for my coffee too, right? I drink very simple black coffee, just plain, no milk, no cream, no sprinkles, nothing. And I was waiting my turn in the queue. And as I got to where I took this photograph, I could hear the orders coming out inside the store. And honestly, it was like urban poetry. People didn't seem to be ordering a cup of coffee. They were ordering some art form, you know, with 15 things on it. They wanted a mocha, chocker, frapper, uh, hold the milk, soya milk, caramel syrup, but no sugar, half and half. The, the list was endless and they were always punctuated at the end with one of the things I still don't understand about ordering a cup of coffee. And they'd always finish it with, and I'd like that extra hot, please. Now tell me, really, seriously, somebody needs to explain to me how a hot cup of coffee is nuclear and, and what difference an extra hot cup of coffee makes. Anyway, as I was listening and as I was getting closer and as I was ready to order my black coffee in a medium sized cup, I actually freaked out because I thought I can feel people's disappointment when I get to the front of the queue and everyone's waiting for this slam poetry order. And all I was going to say was a black cup of coffee, please. So I did what any self-respecting Englishman does in a moment of crisis. I turned around and ran away. But as I was running away, I was thinking to myself, when did the world become so complicated? When did everything of value have to be so complex? And it got me thinking about education. And over the last few years, as we've tried to change education, have we really tried to change it? Or have we just focused on making it more efficient? Have we gone back to the simple principles of what makes great education? Or have we increasingly complicated the system with more and more and more and more initiatives, which are increasingly complicated? You know, it's part of human nature. In order to justify our instincts, our beliefs, we tend to try and overcomplicate to make it look clever. And actually one of the things I think we need to do, and particularly now after what we've just lived through, is strip things back a little bit and look at some maybe some more simple fundamental points. And that's what I want to do with you this morning in the time I've got with you. So let's, let's start here. 
at the very beginning. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen images like that before, particularly if you have children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews or young children in your family, or even if you're privileged enough to work with young children. You know, we've all come home to a picture like that where mummy and daddy are presented at the door with this. And we do the right things, don't we, as parents? We go, oh, darling, that's beautiful. And our little babies go, thank you. And that's great because you're encouraging and supporting. But then what happens next is really interesting. Because then we ask a question which changes everything about the way we see the world. You know, it's always fascinated me how extraordinarily brilliant very young children are at learning. Now, I don't know how you create the percentage, but I remember hearing in my teacher training many, many years ago, a statistic that we learn somewhere between 70 and 75% of everything we learn in our lifetime before we're five years old. Now, again, I don't know how you turn that into percentage, but I get the sentiment. You know, if you think about the complexity of what we learn in those first five years, we learn to, most of us, walk and talk, to understand body language, vocal intonation, facial expression. We learn to make sense of the sensory world around us. And all of these things happen before we're five. And then what happens? The human learning graph goes from this and slowly degrades as we get older and older and older, partly because of our curiosity dropping, and we'll come back to that. And what happens is at this point when you're presented with this picture as a parent or a carer or an aunt or uncle or grandparent, is we say, darling, that's lovely. What is it? And it's at that point that our human perception is things can only be of value if somebody else says they are. And it's at that point we stop just believing in the joy of simplicity and we start to overcomplicate. And so one of the critical things we have to do as we move forward in education is not always believe it's about what's next, the next complicated system, the next complicated approach, the next complicated book written by the next genius. Sometimes it's about taking it backwards and it's about asking how could we actually reverse the curve? What could we do to keep people's curiosity burning at whatever age they are? How could we reverse the curve so that people don't feel that education is something they're presented with or somebody else tells them is important? but actually that active process, because that takes us back to that whole feeling around change and our response to education. If we feel in control, we're far more positive, far more confident and far more likely to embrace it. Let me tell you about a remarkable friend of mine. And I know from the picture, none of you will recognize him and that's fine. But this is Sebastian Foucan and you can look him up on YouTube and the internet later. Sebastian is an amazing guy. He's the founder of parkour or free running, as some people know it. And for some of you, you may have seen him if you ever saw the first Daniel Craig James Bond film, Casino Royale. You will have seen him in that film in the opening chase sequence. He played the bad guy. He's a remarkable, remarkable man. And we first met actually um, when we were allowed to travel a few years ago in Yekaterinburg, which is a city in Russia. And on our day off, we went for a little visit around. We went for a walk around the town and it was beautiful. The architecture, the building, stunning. Anyway, when we got back to the hotel, I asked Seb what he thought of the buildings. I said, weren't they magnificent? And he said, I don't know, Richard. I wasn't looking at the buildings. He said, actually, that goes back to my childhood. And in a way, it goes back to how we founded parkour and the reason for it. You see, to him, free running, base jumping, parkour isn't a sport, it's a mindset. And he explained to me why. He said, as a child, I lived in a concrete jungle north of Paris. He said, there seemed to be no exit, there seemed to be no hope. He said, but I started to become fascinated by the thin shards of light between the buildings. And I started to play with my imagination and wonder where they would take me. And he said, that's really where parkour comes from. He said, you see, most people, when they walk through an urban environment, look at the buildings and their obstacles, they're in the way. But the mindset shift is how do we look at the spaces between the buildings? Because the spaces between the buildings are beautiful. 
And they're beautiful aesthetically, but they're also beautiful because they constitute and represent an onward journey. And in many ways, too many of us spend too long looking at the buildings and not enough time exploring the spaces. So we all know, for example, that education is complex and there's an awful lot of top down that happens to us. But our job sometimes can't be just to be forced to focus on those things, but to spend a little bit of our time looking at the spaces, looking at the deeper, looking at the stuff that really matters. And I think one of the things that this crisis has taught us more than anything else is that we are going to have to build more three-dimensional people. We are going to have to find a way to focus on soft skills development in education as much as we do about knowledge. I mean, here's a thought for you. Imagine that your lecture rooms, your classrooms, wherever you teach, are like casinos. And every day your students come in and you're asking them to gamble with their self-esteem. You know, when we think about it, there's no argument, is there? Learning is really tough, really, really tough. And it's tough because in order to learn something new, you have to realize you're at the point of a mistake or the realization you don't know something or you can't do something, which means you have to be prepared to fail and make mistakes. Yet, of course, that relies so much on self-esteem. So every day they're coming into your casino and they're waiting for you to spin the wheel and roll the ball. And then what they're doing is saying, come on, gamble some of your self-esteem, engage with me in the learning journey. Now, some kids, some students, you know them, the high rollers, they come in with bagfuls of poker chips of self-esteem. They chuck chips on red, chips on black, chips on odd, chips on even. It doesn't matter because they know that even if it comes up different, They've got plenty of poker chips left to play with. And then there are other students who walk in who are great people, but they're walking in with one poker chip of self-esteem and they would love to play your game. But they look at you, roll the ball and spin the wheel and they think, I cannot put my chip down because if I put it on red and it comes up black, if I put it on odd and it comes up even and I don't get it right, I've got nothing left. So there's a critical question there before we start looking at what we should teach. One of the great questions is, are our students ready to learn? Do they have enough poker chips to play the game? So here's a big question for you. What do we want them to look like when they leave us as human beings? That'd be a great starting point, wouldn't it? A conversation with your colleagues, your students, your children, your pupils. What do we want them to look like as human beings when they leave us? What kind of characteristics? What kind of skills? What kind of behaviors? And here's an idea for you. And it's really based on a model that I developed when I was privileged enough to be a school principal. That in many ways, our job as educators at whatever level we're working is to raise our students' aspirations. But before we do that, we have to help so many of them dream, right? A lot of our students have very limited life experiences and particularly those from challenging backgrounds. So what we have to do in order to help them develop aspirations is help them broaden their experiences so that they can dream. You know, kids from really great homes are exposed to so much wonderful stuff that to an extent that bit happens naturally. And really the job of an educator is to take their dreams and help them turn them into aspirations. And by that, what I mean is a dream's a fantasy and aspiration's tangible. And in order to build the aspiration, you have to put rungs on a ladder. And that's the knowledge and the skills that we're working with with our students. Because then suddenly the desire to be a scientist or an astronaut or a dancer or a musician or a salesperson or whatever it might be, they become tangible because they can see the lungs on the ladder they have to climb in order to get there. So firstly, that's it. We have to develop in our students a love of learning and how it connects to their lives. To do that, we have to develop in them the skills, attributes and knowledge that they're going to need. But here's the kicker. I wonder if too much of what we do in our schools and colleges is abstract. Learn this because it's important and trust me, one day you'll understand why. Is it enough to turn around to students and say, look, this is really important to know for an exam? Or does that just become transitory learning? So how do we apply our learning 
in contexts that's rich in experience. You know, it's something that early years practitioners do with unbelievable talent and ability. They actually take really complex concepts and they make it tangible by making the active learning and experiential. They say to themselves when they're planning, okay, how do I take the learning to a point of contact within my students' understanding and life? How do I take away the abstract? And of course, if we get that process right, if we find ways to truly connect what they need to learn to the lives they're leading, we get that right we can develop in them a sense of aspiration and value and by value what i mean is a belief that they have a place in the world they have a place in society local national global and that's fired by their aspirations so how do we begin that process well i want to tell you a little bit uh, about this the difference between the assumption of incompetence and the assumption of excellence. In so many of our lives, we have experienced, both as students and as education professionals, management above us that is very traditional and very common in most traditional industries. And that is the belief of the assumption of incompetence. In other words, that people will only do their best if they're managed to do their best. Now, of course, if you think about it, traditional performance management, traditional structures are all under the belief, and also policymakers and politicians believe this of our students, that somehow we're all lazy and we'll only do our best if we're made to do our best. Now, of course, the problem with that model is it creates a reliance culture. And actually, it allows us to sit back and go, OK, will you tell me what to do and how to do it and reward me when it's done? And if we're living in a world of certainty, that kind of works. You know, that Taylorist model of industrial thinking, of focusing on efficiency so you improve productivity, so in turn you improve profit and you reinvest that in efficiency. And in so many ways, that's how our education policy has been designed over 100 years or more. But this world we're living in now requires a different mindset. And that's where the assumption of excellence comes in. Some of them are the world's most dynamic companies. Some of the most exciting and incredible places I've worked operate under an assumption of excellence. In other words, they don't manage everybody up to a level and then let them loose. They assume people are brilliant. They create the conditions for those people to flourish. That doesn't mean they don't manage people, but they only manage people when they need managing. And what that means is you promote and create a far more powerful sense of self-leadership, of self-management. And that means that when we come to process of change of un and uncertainty, people have more resilience, more poker chips, and are able to engage in that process more actively. A couple of years ago, I was doing some work with Google. And I came across their own research into what made some of their most successful teams so successful. And you can find this on the internet. The research was called Project Aristotle, and it really focused on the climate within the best teams in the Google organization. And there were five key characteristics of the most powerful teams at Google. And I think they resonate incredibly powerful, powerfully with us in education. And I just want to share them with you now. So the most dynamic teams at Google operate under these five approaches. First and most important, they're environments that are powerful in psychological safety. In other words, people feel totally relaxed about being themselves, about speaking what they believe, what they understand, what they don't understand, sharing their ideas, and being able to do so in a climate where there isn't blame and where people aren't ridiculed for saying something that might be ob obvious or simple or making a mistake or getting something wrong. And of course, that psychological safety is so powerful in our best learning environments. Secondly, dependability, that there's huge trust in those teams. Everybody trusts everybody else to do their job so that there is, and this leads on to the third point, a real sense of structure and clarity. Everybody understands their role, everybody understands their relationship, and everybody understands what they're striving for. And that brings me on to the fourth one, 
meaning. And that goes back to my cycle of learning in a way. Are we making sure that what we're asking people to engage in, in that tough, rigorous way, has real meaning to them over and above just the need to be able to pass an examination? And then finally, that they can see their efforts are having a profound impact at whatever level they're working at, that they genuinely feel that their involvement and their engagement is having a real impact on the organization. There's a wonderful story that I heard many years ago about the Pixar University, and I haven't got time to, to go through that now in great detail, but I'm, re I'm really sorry. But basically, every employee at Google gets to go and experience new learning during their paid employment during the working week. And it can be anything they like, as long as it's accredited and it doesn't have anything to do with their day job. And one of the people who was working in the kitchens, a guy that chopped and served salad, got the opportunity through this program to learn to pilot a hot air balloon. And one lunchtime, as luck would have it, he was serving salad to one of the creative directors. And she was so captured by his story of learning to pilot a hot air balloon that she asked him to work with one of her creative teams on an idea based on his experience. And he said he would. And the core for him was this. He said, you know, I'm, I'm not a man of words. I'm not a man of intelligence. He said, but when I was up there doing my solo flight for the first time to get my license, he said, I felt truly free. Anyway, out of that conversation, out of that ability for everyone in the organization to feel they have an impact, Pixar developed the film Up. And for those of you that have seen it, you'll understand the resonance of the power of that. So how do we make sure that everyone is celebrated for their impact? And then my final thought is this, and it's about another meeting I had with a great, great human being. This is, this is Barry Barish. Some of you may know who Barry is, many I'm sure won't. Barry Barish won the 2017 Nobel Prize for Physics for his work into, and forgive me, I'm not a scientist, for his work into gravitational waves. And I got the chance to ask Barry about how he went about recruiting his research team that were so brilliant that they went on to win a Nobel Prize. He said, it's a great question. He said, we had over three and a half thousand serious applicants. And I asked him to qualify that. And he said, well, by serious, what I mean, Richard, is they were all world-renowned scientists, three and a half thousand. They had at least two doctorates in different forms of science. He said, but we only had research spaces for 138 people. I said, so what criteria did you use to get that number down? He said, two things. And these are the two thoughts I want to leave you with this morning before we open up to the floor for some questions, I hope. He said, the first thing is this, nobody made it onto my team if they didn't have experiences of the arts and the sciences in their background. He said, in my experience, we silo people too quickly, too often, too soon. And that limits their ability to think cure, uh, creatively. That limits their ability to think three-dimensionally. So we need to make sure that no matter what level we're working at in education, we ensure that our people have a richness of experience across the entire range of human development. And I said, and what was the second point? He said, the second point was this. He said, nobody made it onto my team if they didn't have the ability to ask stupid questions. Just think about that for a moment. Elegantly simple on the surface, but wouldn't that be a great starting point for how we develop and design the future of education? Do we create climates within our settings that promote the asking of stupid questions? Thank you so much for logging in this morning and spending time with me. Wherever you are in the world, it's been an absolute thrill that we can be together in this time where we can't be together. And with that, Rachel, I'm going to hand back to you to take any questions. Hi, Richard. Thank you so much. I know that you haven't been keeping an eye on the chat box because I know you like to focus on delivering your talk, but 
once again, Richard, the, the chat box um, full of comments and real, real positive feedback there for you to start with. But what's also lovely, and thank you so much for everyone um, who's attended, lots of debate and discussions and comments about what you're saying. So that's really wonderful to see. I'm going to throw a few questions your way, if you don't mind, Richard. Absolutely. Now, bear with me, everybody. I've been practicing my pronunciation of these names, but inevitably, it probably won't be quite right. I'm going to start with a question from Yorit Jaramillo. I'm sure I've pronounced that very badly. I'm so sorry. Um, which would you consider? What, what are the important arguments you would consider, Richard, to propose to your school authority to promote and give the needed importance to soft skills for our students? I think so how, there are can, how can teachers, sorry, how can teachers kind of, you know, stress that importance? I think there are, I think there are two things really. Um, I mean, many, we, we could talk about this all day. It's a great observation. Um, the first and most important thing is in the immediacy of the lived experience that we've just gone through. You know, what we've realized is that the people that have coped best are the ones with a profound sense and ability to collaborate, to share emotional intelligence, to um, talk to one another, to think creatively, to be able to find ways to be proactive rather than reactive. And just that lived experience over the last six or seven months has been so incredibly important and so vital. You know, I'm not going to get political here, but when you look at the politicians that are perceiving to have handled the crisis the best, they are ones that are steeped in high levels of emotional intelligence. And that reflects also in the world of employment. You know, the OECD in 2013 produced the first ever global research report into the links between employment, education, and skills. And a couple of things that, the, that were executive summaries in that report were very powerful. The first was that it said that countries where there was a focus on formal qualifications above everything else were the countries where young people would find it increasingly difficult to get jobs. And that was because the future workplace was now far more um, focused on interpersonal skills as a key characteristic rather than routine cognitive skills. And that works, by the way, for every organization in the world, whether it's someone like Barry Barish, who is at the leading front of scientific research, or major organizations like Ernst & Young and PricewaterhouseCooper, who are both now considering stopping their graduate, graduate entry pro, uh, programs, because what they're more interested in is getting people in at 18 who possess really powerful soft skills, because they know that they can teach the technical skills those students would often go to university for in maybe six or seven weeks. Uh, and so one of the things we have to be really cognizant of is that it's not an either or, by the way. It, we're not saying it's soft skills over knowledge and academic development, but we have to find a better, stronger balance between the two if we're really going to create young people that can not just survive but thrive in what is going to be an increasingly uncertain and changeable future. Wonderful. Thanks, Richard. And um, from Ali Garber, we've got, um, I'm worried about what I have perceived as a change focused on technology. My girl, so her, her children's school, they're implementing using tablets instead of books, for example, and she's having a hard time embracing that kind of change when she feels like technology has a place, but shouldn't be the be all and end all. What are your thoughts on that? I, again, um, Ali, an amazing uh, observation and one I think we should all be very cognizant of. Um, you know, technology is an incredible tool. It's an incredible catalyst. And in many parts of the world, it's a way of democratizing knowledge and education, which makes it incredibly powerful. But I think you're right. I think what we mustn't do is use technology just because it's the latest silver bullet or the latest idea or it looks cool. Um, and as I said earlier in my speech, sometimes we have have to go back before we go forwards. And again, let me very quickly tell you about a meeting I had with one of the world's leading and most celebrated technologists, Eric Schmidt, who was until a couple of years ago, the executive chairman of Google. 
And I asked him the question, do you ever see a time where technology will replace the teacher? Thinking he and I could have a really rich and powerful debate about it. And his answer was immediate and unequivocal. He said, no, never Richard. And I said, wow, I wasn't expecting that. Can you talk me through it? He said, absolutely. He said, technology is incredible. It is a massive tool of empowerment, of collaboration, of connection. And we've seen that over the last six or seven months where technology has been used in such powerful ways. For example, this today facilitated by Cambridge University Press and Cambridge Assessment, right? This is a wonderful tool for collaboration and bringing people together from around the world. But he said, education is first and foremost about the development of human beings. And in order to develop human beings, you will always need high levels of human interaction. And so I think we have to be very careful about the balance and realizing that technology can never be the master tool for education because education done well is always about the development of those three dimensional human beings. Sorry for the delay, Richard. Bear it's with okay. me. I'm juggling lots of question boxes here, trying to trying to find the uh, some really interesting. There's so many, you see. This is the problem I'm having choosing the questions. That's um, great. Okay, this is a great one because this came up last time. Um, asking stupid questions, a mm -hmm. great idea which I'm going to use. But is there really such a thing as a stupid question? Huh. Um, I think that's one that came up last time, no, Richard? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that one to you as well, because I know you didn't have a lot of time to explain that in the session. Yeah, no, I, I think it's absolutely incredibly powerful. And of course, the answer is no, there's no such thing as a stupid question. But the problem is too many of us perceive that too many of our questions are stupid. And as a result, we don't ask them. You know, for example, how many times have the people online now been in a faculty meeting or a team meeting as a highly qualified professional and listened to the conversation and thought, either I don't understand or surely it can be more obvious than that. But they look around the room, you know, a bit like um, a spaghetti Western and they think, who's going to shoot first? Please somebody ask that question. Or am I the only one that's thinking it? And because I'm the only one that's thinking it, it must be stupid. So the tragedy is it never gets asked, even though probably everyone in the room is thinking the same thing. And actually it's about that ability to be honest and to have the confidence to speak what you believe and what you think because so often that's where the innovation that's where the real joy and collaboration comes from you know it goes back to the google stuff around um, project aristotle and creating an environment of psychological safety so that person's absolutely right and the priority really is to create an environment of, of psychological safety so nobody believes that any question is stupid great one here from rupert um, who's obviously seen kind of the importance in all of the ideas you've been speaking about and um, the need really to be collaborative with your with your workmates with your colleagues and Rupert's asking, how can we persuade workmates who are maybe a little bit more resistant or reluctant to collaborate and be more collaborative? Again, that's an incredibly powerful um, question, Rupert. And I think the answer, I'm, I'm afraid, isn't easy. But one of the things that's really important is not to pursue a single focus on consensus. You know, all too often, when you are an emotionally intelligent person desperate to share and collaborate, you want to bring everybody on board. And we see that very powerfully in, in education environments where people want to involve everyone. So, you know, if, for example, you're managing or leading a team, you sit down, you want to share an idea and two or three people don't get it somehow the whole thing stagnates and you don't move forward the really important thing and <laughs> I apologize for using this analogy particularly in current times but I can't find another one at the moment is the way we change transform and collaborate is through and, and here it is contagion right there will always be people that get it and and if if you find one or two people that get it don't hold back because others don't pursue it start to develop it because the people that are hanging back are probably hanging back because they're nervous and they're just wanting and waiting to find out how things are going to develop and as people's confidence grows they'll jump on board and the thing is to start role modeling with the people that are ready because that's the contagion and as soon as people start to see the energy 
and the control and the excitement that that kind of development group starts to show, more and more people will get involved. I mean, sadly, there might always be one or two that never get involved, but you can't always, you cannot work to the lowest common denominator. Great one here, um, thinking about, um, we've spoken about colleagues now, um, thinking about parents. Um, and again, apologies, but I'm going to try to pronounce, pronounce your name as best as I can. Urvashi Un Uniyal is asking, to start this kind of thing, we need some stirrers that can lead parents to also think in this way. Um, any tips or advice for how to do that, Richard? Yeah, I mean, again, I think this is really important. Often with parents, there's a kind of a disconnect between the worlds they're leading and particularly professional parents and people in employment and what they want for their children. You know, the problem with education is everybody's an expert because most of us have been through it, right? So we all think there is one way to do it. And to an extent, and I understand it, parents who have gone on to become successful in their own lives think that that's partly due to their education, and it is. But of course, their education prepared them for a very different world, and their success has been achieved in a very different environment. So one of the things we have to do is broaden the narrative and help parents understand the connection that exists now between the pathways from education into a successful adult life. And so beginning those conversations, maybe by talking about their own workplace and what kind of characteristics are now seen as premium qualities in new young employees starts to change the conversation. Because I think sadly, all too often, education's in a silo over here and the workplace is in a silo over here. And very rarely do we create that knitted narrative. And maybe part of our job as passionate, skilled educators is to help to weave that narrative better. And if we can do that, those conversations can become more constructive and more progressive with our parents. I'm gonna leave you um, on this question to, to finish with, um, Richard, from Dom. That was easy enough to pronounce for me. Yeah. Hi, what do you think the company of the future will look like? Oh my goodness me, that is an unbelievable question. I think that the company of the future will be pretty much made up of huge movable parts. I think there will be people at the center of that organization that have a series of visions and a vision and values, a sense of purpose, a sense of, of what it is they're trying to achieve. But I actually think the freelancing world is going to become increasingly um, important. You know, as people move away from big office spaces, as people start to create a hybrid working environment, what that actually is going to allow people to do is hire experts from all over the world at the point of need for particular programs and projects. So for me, what that means is we are going to have to work even harder at creating generations that aren't being prepared to get into a job for life, but actually have the ability to understand their strengths, their weaknesses, how to sell themselves, and how to to integrate and work at phenomenal pace in new and differing teams on a constant basis. Well, unfortunately, we, we have so many more questions there, but we're out of time, sadly. So it just leaves me to say, once again, thank you so much, um, Richard, for, for being with us here this morning. Um, and as I said, the comments that have come in in the chat box, the discussions, the debates, and the, you know, the feedback that's come from the, the, the things that you've brought up have been fantastic. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you to all of you that have attended and thank you, Cambridge, for inviting me. I hope thank one you. day some of us get to meet in person. Take care.